Welcome back to Writers on Writing. I'm your host, Marie Stone. Today, I welcome back one of my favorite past guests. Bonnie Jo Campbell first came on the show with me in 2010 for her collection, American Savage, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and the National Book Critics Circle Award. She came on again in 2015 with her collection, Mothers Tell Your Daughters. And then she came on actually into our little radio station in Irvine in 2017 with Jenny Fagan to talk about their Outrider project. You can find those interviews up in our archives. She's also the author of four other books, including the best-selling novel, Once Upon a River, which was just optioned and developed into the award-winning feature film in 2020. Bonnie Jo's highly anticipated novel, The Waters, comes out next week. It is already receiving rave reviews. A recent doozy in the Washington Post that I will link to in our show notes where you can, can read all about it. It follows three generations of women in the swamplands of Michigan. Herbalist Ermine herself, Zook, is the matriarch and the area's healer, homeopath, or witch, depending on the way the town looks at her. Bonnie Jo has been called the master of rural Narar, and this book delivers it. Today we talk about fairy tales in literary fiction how to talk about contemporary and divisive issues in accessible ways, how to make the most of your settings, breathing life into mysterious characters, Bonnie Jo's revision process, and much more. By the way, I heard a rumor that she made more than a thousand edits even after the advanced reading copy was released. <laughs> so I may have read the wrong book, but I hope not, because the one I read felt, felt perfect. Bonnie Jo Campbell, welcome back. Oh, it's so great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So a lot has happened since June of 2017 when we last talked, both both in the world and I know from following you online in your own life. And uh, yeah, so how are you doing? How have these yeah, years been for a, you? What a time. What a few years it's been. I think we've all we all feel like we've kind of been through the ringer. You know, we've all had, you know, everybody I meet has had a preponderance of personal and personal issues, health issues and everything else. So, you know, maybe it's the t it's the age or the age. We used to talk about the age of Aquarius. I don't know what age we're in now, but it seems it seems like we're going to having a rough go. But maybe a lot of good fiction will come out of it. Well, you know, that's I think that is already starting to happen. I, you know, I can I can start to see how these last few years have really affected the artistic process. I follow it even in the visual arts. I do feel like that is happening. So, yeah. That's the yeah, side. it's interesting because right away there were a, there was a smattering of kind of COVID books that came out, and it seemed like there's not enough time has passed to really digest what we just went through, you know. So maybe maybe the nonfiction was getting at it first, you know. People were getting at the nonfiction aspects, but you know, fiction. Some people have said it really takes about seven years to really fully digest a lot of the the personal things we go through. Yeah, well, I can see a lot of those without giving too much away about the novel. I can, you know, I can see things starting to to seep in using the Swampland <laughs> metaphor. I can see them seeping into this novel. So, yeah, hopefully <laughs> we get a chance to talk about all of that. I feel like when I've gone back to old interviews, there were little seeds and kernels of this book for a long time. Tell me when this kind of started forming in your brain and, and how. Well, uh, the book itself, probably I started it about, I don't know, eight years ago. But, you know, this, this happened with my previous novel, Once Upon a River. If I really honestly look at where the real seeds and kernels of it were, they were even before that. I would wanted to write about a, a girl who loves mathematics for a long time because I love mathematics. You know, I came I came to mathematics late. I kind of I kind of took it up in college and af after college and graduate school. But I just was interested in what mathematics could do for for a young woman, like maybe in the same way that my my character, Margot Crane, had had an ability to shoot. That was her superpower. I was kind of interested in what what a, a girl who really could do mathematics would have if that was her superpower. So <laughs> she was kind of the inspiration for it a, a long time ago. And I, I actually have an entire other novel written when the girl, whose nickname is Donkey, when she is 17, there's an entire, I have an entire novel written. I don't know if 
that it's any good. But I found myself wanting to go back in time and puzzle out what was the family, what was her family like when she was growing up and what were the complicating factors. And it's funny because that novel that takes place later was kind of a comedy, you know, it was trying to be a comedy. And when I went back and found the roots of the trouble, it, it turned into something a little deeper. Interesting. Yeah, because I was going to ask if this ever started as a short story, because I know you're such a master of the short story forum. And, and I feel like a lot of novels get their start that way, you know, that it just becomes something bigger. But this sounds like it, it birthed like Zeus is uh, whatever out of his head from another novel. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, it really did. It, it really had to be a novel from the beginning. And, you know, Once Upon a River started out as a short story and a, a short story that's an American salvage. Uh, called Family Reunion. But this this one did start out as a novel. And, and there's a way in which I sort of feel it's, it's my first novel, true novel, in a sense, because uh, my, my other two novels, uh, Q Road was a novel in different, um, this novel, The Waters, is really an omniscient novel. It has a po an omniscient point of view. You know, it's written from God's point of view. But um, my novel, Q Road, was in, it was in a variety of local points of view. And so I always felt like I was cheating because it was like a bunch of short stories mashed together. And Once Upon a River, I always felt like it was just so episodic. You know, it was like the Odyssey. The Odyssey is very episodic. And the way that Odysseus battled his monsters, my girl Margot had her adventures. But this one, it really felt like a novel, novel from, from the get-go. And and therefore, it was more difficult to write. Yeah, I was going to say, if you could talk about that a little bit, because the landscape of a novel, especially this one, I mean, it's incredibly broad and deep at the same time. It uses all of its 400 or whatever it is pages. And that <laughs> landscape is big. You know, that canvas is so much so big. And so I was wondering how you kind of made that mental transition Especially because I, I do think a lot of short story writers who write novels can trick themselves with, you know, I'm just going to write 12 short stories and kind of make it feel like a, you know, in the same territory. But th this this is not that. No, I, I often have said that uh, I, I think my novels are actually failed short stories. You know, I, I, I start out trying to write something and then I realize it's not going to wrap up. It's not going to wrap up in 15 pages. So I, I knew that right away. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, I could say that this, this novel kind of did spring out of landscape. It sprang from, it, it grew from the swamp that I created for it. But what really makes a novel is architecture. And it's just the hardest thing to do when you're a writer like me, because I want everything to be very organic. I usually start out writing by having a, a character I'm interested in, a challenging character, in a very difficult situation. And so that's just an organic situation, and I see what arises from that situation. And so I can write a whole short story that way and not really need architecture other than what naturally springs up. But in a novel, I mean, a novel is a journey. I mean, a novel, people have expectations of novels. They want to feel they've been on a journey when they read a novel. And like a journey, at the beginning, you have expectations and you have their promises. You know, the author makes promises at the beginning. And then in the middle of it, it better be really absorbing and you better be completely caught up with everything. And then at the end, every single other thing has to, every single thing in the whole book has to come together Every sentence, I believe, has to tie together, and the reader has to really feel it meant something. You know, a, a short story, you can just, that's just like going to, that's just like an evening at the bar. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. you just want to have a good time when you read a short story. But I think when you're reading a novel, you want to feel like you've gone somewhere, and it means something, and maybe changed you a little tiny bit. As we were talking about at the beginning of our time, the last six years have been so divisive and fraught. And I think I heard you say at some point that the characters in your books are characters that your average reader 
would walk away from on the street and would openly shun or refuse to spend time with. And I think there's such an innate curiosity about the other right now, you know, as we're so divisive, we're also like, what the hell is that person thinking? What, what the hell is going through their head? And so being able to understand this cast of characters who a lot of us don't have access to and spend time with them and really deeply understand what's going on in their head and really fall in love with them and sympathize with them. I think it's just, you know, that's always the import of fiction, but I feel like it's even more important right now. And this novel does that so much for me. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It was really important to me. You know, I didn't know that I was going to do that when I thought the novel was going to be a little bit of a lighter fare. I was really most just interested in the women. I was interested in these women who were kind of kind of under siege, <laughs> you know, yeah. in their home. I think I think maybe some of us women have felt under fire, I guess, in a way in society. We've we've felt a little bit oppressed. And so I was kind of looking at, you know, making the situation a little more extreme by isolating the women and you know they live on an island <laughs> but then the novel really started making sense when I actually did reach out to the men you know when I reached out to see really see the men that's when the novel meant more to me and once I did it I, I realized this is like cracking open the world of the division. I mean, it's like I was jumping over the divide, I guess, by getting into the heads of the very people who seem to be causing all the problems. I mean, in, in my initial conception, all oh, these women, they're interesting women, but they're, they're kind of being picked on by the community. But then to get into the heads of the people in the community and understand why this is happening really I don't know, really made everything matter more. So having, and having an important love affair in the book, some people have said they consider it a tragic love affair, but I really don't. I think real love, real love is really and truly, I'm, I guess I'm a hopeless romantic. I think it's, it's everlasting if it ever was that real love. And uh, having that love and having that be something that people could look at from both sides of the divide. You know, I guess Romeo, it's all Romeo and Juliet, isn't it? <laughs> right, right. Because <laughs> that's what happens in Shakespeare is the families finally come together after the deaths. Right. It's Shakespearean, it's Greek, it's fairy tale. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it, did you notice that the men are kind of acting like a Greek chorus? That was kind of how I had, I mean, at one point I kind of referred to them as the seven dwarves, but they're yes. really acting as kind of a a chorus for the town, and I thought that was fun. I now realize we're a third of the way into the interview, and I, I sort of introduced it at the very beginning, but I don't know if I did a great job. I should probably let you talk about the book in general and fill in all the gaps that I missed. Oh, no, I think this is good. You know, it's a novel that takes place in a small town in Michigan. And as I mentioned, it's in the omniscient point of view so that you get points of view from people all over the community. And, you know, initially I was telling a smaller story, but by the end I felt that I was identifying the roots of this large division that we feel in American society, and I was identifying it in a, in a small community. And that makes the novel sound more political than it is. But, uh, <laughs> but I was very interested in issues of fertility. Um, I'm going to say that almost every contemporary political issue does come up in the book. But yeah. Yeah. there's nothing strident in the book. It's just these issues really, the reason they matter to us, issues of gun control, issues of women's rights, women's reproductive rights, issues of land use and pollution, those things come up naturally for the people in this book. And so we see where the roots of all this trouble is, you know, the, or the roots where they are, hopefully. But, and also it's sort of a dynamic 
story. It's a love story, and it, it's a family saga of three generations. So, Yeah, you're giving language to one of my big questions, which is, you're right, you hit on climate change and abortion and gun control and all of these hot-button issues, and it never feels hot-button. It just feels, as you're, as you're talking about, it just feels very organic and of their lives and and accessible and it, you know it it's not whatever side of the divide you stand on any one of those issues you can come to this with a sense of empathy for the characters and at least understanding of how they got to where they got to and i was wondering if that it does sound all very organic if if there was ever a time when you were like well i want to talk about these issues but how do i do that without putting my reader off. Was that ever challenging or is it just stay in the story? No, stay because in the story? I never came at it as issues. I yeah. only came at it through character. I only came at it through the experiences of my characters. And so I didn't have to worry about that. I mean, I guess I could still worry, you know, I'm, I, you know, it's very possible that people could take offense at the book, at aspects of the book, but you know, when you come at it through character, then you're being honest. You know, you're being very honest and you're not being, and not that a political, coming at it politically is dishonest, but I guess, I guess going back to the organicness of it, I'm not trying to make, I'm not trying to make any statement. I'm just trying to figure out how these people feel about these incidences and experiences that arise in their lives. Right. Going back to that omniscient point of view, which was so great, and I was trying to figure out how you did it, because we were, you know, I was kind of thinking of Tinkerbell alighting on somebody's head, and now we're in their point of view. I know, it's a- really <laughs> hard to do, because it, it's yeah. not, you know, there's, it, it's not, and it's not just going around from one point of view to the other. I actually, I mean, there are places where I say how the world is, and that was hard for me. You know, that was hard for me. I couldn't have done it 10 years ago. And I hate to say it, I probably couldn't have done it while my mother was alive because she would have, she always cut me down to size. So I probably (laughs) wouldn't have had the nerve to say, this is how the world has changed since people left their farms and became factory workers. You know, this is how the world has changed since the church You know, these people have a certain church in their community. And at one time in the past, the church was kind of an ecstatic church, a church where people were seeking grace and they wanted to be touched by holiness. But now the church that they go to has kind of become a prescriptive church where they leave with a a list of instructions and they're told who to vote for, Mm -hmm. you know. And and so I kind of stated you know i kind of said how the world is so i'll i'll have to see if anybody takes me to task for it <laughs> i'll see if my mother comes back and haunts me right, she does right. haunt me she haunts me on a regular basis so <laughs> i was reading some great essays other writers coming and hanging out with your mom and so did she pass during the writing process yes she did she passed away in 2020 and she had been sick for a lot she was in hospice so that was part of the experience of writing the book when she was she was very sick for a while and then she was in hospice and it's fun there's actually a trailer my filmmaker friend harula rose who who made the once upon a river movie also we we worked together to make a trailer for this movie so if anybody you maybe you can link to that Very pictures true. of my mom in the trailer as as her mean yes, <laughs> yes my mom's an inspiration for many kinds many types of women yeah what a face So as we go back to talking about this roving point of view, the other thing that feels like it would be difficult is if you're staying in either first person or close third person, you have a voice for your character. You know, each character kind of has their own voice, their own style. Here you really have to sort of have an overarching voice for the book and yet still have individual voices for the characters. And I'm not talking about dialogue here. I'm really talking about how these characters see the world. I don't know if I'm making sense here. But Absolutely. I... And it's, it has to have that grand, there's kind of a grand authorial voice that shows up in the yes. book. And the real challenge, I mean, a lot of the challenge of writing this book and getting it right was going into that voice at all because 
I'm a Midwestern girl. I mean, I grew up on a farm. I'm not fancy and I'm not confident and I'm not why. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm wiser than I was, but I'm not, you know, I'm not a wise woman. And so getting into that wise authorial voice was a real challenge for me and then getting out of it again. And so writing in that voice and then moving from that voice to other characters, it really, it really was a challenge. And that was a lot of the writing, a lot of the writing of the book and revising was about those transitions moving yeah. to and fro. The book swelled to 650 pages at one point. It was huge. Mm -hmm. And cutting it back was a real challenge because, I mean, a lot of things happened. The thing with the omniscient voice is I knew everything that happened. And so, you know, there are mysteries in the book. And if the authorial voice knows everything, then it kind of seems coy to hold anything back from the reader. So, so I had to really work hard to make sure it didn't seem like I was doing that as the mysteries are contained. You know, the mysteries are revealed throughout the book. And I had to be very thoughtful about how I revealed them. And I tried not to rely too much on, I kind of couldn't rely on plot in the same way that I could rely on it if it was just one voice, where I was limited to what one person knew. Right. So it was a real right. dance between these characters and among them. And, and yeah, a lot of the work was cutting. So at what point did you map out everything that was going to happen? Like at one point, did you know the ending for yourself? I and all the kept working on it. I kept this, this plagued me because I didn't know if I'd written something good or bad. I mean, I thought it might be something really bad that I'd just written that I just spent years writing something because I couldn't <laughs> get it to behave. I couldn't get it to go into this. No, I, I went, I went back and read a whole bunch of books about writing, like things that beginning writers read because I couldn't figure out why can't I just write this book? Why won't it, you know, why won't it turn into a three act, whatever, you know, you know, the thing they tell you to write and I just wouldn't behave. And I actually just recently learned what I've written and I learned it. I mean, I had to feel my way through this. I didn't know what I was writing. I just had to feel my way through. And I know the crazy ending. Why does it end like it is? That's a crazy <laughs> ending. But I just read uh, Sharon Blackie is a mythologist. She's a British mythologist and psychologist. She's kind of a Jungian. And she talks about how the normal novel, which is the often written as the heroic journey, how it really doesn't work for women and it really doesn't work for women over 50. And mm. so mm. what we need is something, the women, what we need is the post heroic novel. We need the woman's journey and the woman's journey is more about community. It's more about family. It's not about one person becoming greater. The structure of it is more of a spiral. And so there's a reason in the book that Rose Thorne keeps going away and coming back. You know, that's an aspect of a spiral. So things keep happening, but they mean more and they mean something different each time they happen. But that's only language that I just, I just got from reading. I've just read all her books, this, this myth mythologist. And it makes perfect sense now that, that we're looking for a kind of woman, a, Often, not everybody, a lot of women are happy with the hero's journey, but if you want something a little more complicated that's about community and family and kind of working together. Yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, and it's possible also that The Wizard of Oz is one of those stories, if you think about it, mm -hmm. that, you know, or, or if you took the Oz books as a whole, that it's always about a a group of people having an adventure together. And, and if you read all the Oz books, they have these continuing adventures where they kind of spiral around and keep touching on the same thing. I don't know. It's something I've been thinking of, you know, as a writer, you have to have all your, your current obsessions and whether they'll stick with me, I don't know, but I'm, I'm really interested in this. Well, as you're talking, and we've talked about this on the show, and she came on here. I don't know if you know Jane Allison and her book, Meander, Spiral, Explode. But it's exactly on this topic, which is, yes, there's the hero's journey, three-act structure. 
And then there are all these other shapes and forms that a novel can take, at one, one of which is spiral. And so I think she lays out like six or eight or different structures a novel can oh take. good see hers is the book i should have picked up instead of instead of reading ben percy right you know <laughs> bless bless ben percy he's such a great guy but he's you know he, he he and the other guys are writing all these books about how to write you know it wasn't working it's not yeah right i made i drew a lot of pictures i kept drawing pictures and saying this is i think they have language like the door opens here you open a door here and and here's where the you know i don't know i drew all these pictures of why what was happening and it just wouldn't it wouldn't settle down it was probably good for me to have had the experience of drawing all these pictures you know it was great fun but you know figuring out what I was doing, but that's where that architecture is that I'm, that we talked about earlier, that architecture that it really does have to add up. It doesn't have to be the three act structure, but it does have to add, the meaning has to be snowballing in some way or other. The meaning in the book has to be keep, you know, every time the rattlesnake appears, it has to mean more. You know, and right. every time Rose Thorn goes away, it has to mean more. So it was an adventure writing it because I, you know, I didn't have any model. Well, and I remember the last time we talked, you were talking about the importance of turning up the heat and you keep <laughs> having to turn up the heat under your characters. And I was wondering if that played into it too, that every time it spiraled around again, it got hotter and hotter. Yes, it did have to. And and I like that aspect. It's helpful for me to talk about students, talk, when I talk to students about turning up the heat. Because, you know, for example, if you have a character, you know, like I say, start a story with a character in a tough situation. Well, make that situation tougher. <laughs> Turn yes. up the heat. Give your character some problem or issue turn up the heat. These are ways of making it matter more. This, if you do this, there can be more at stake and it can mean more when the character finally does do the work that the character has to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. I like thinking about that because, and especially characters who work in the characters who I, I'm not an autobiographical writer, but a lot of my students are, and a lot of my friends are, and that's often the advice I find myself giving them is that, okay, in real life, yes, this meant a lot because it happened to you, but in fact, you know, as a piece of fiction, you can make it, you can make it more than that. In fact, no one cares that it happened to you. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but this really happened. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and I can see how you do that with all kinds of things, with your language choice and with your, I mean, especially with your setting. I mean, setting anything in a swamp in Michigan. <laughs> oh, yeah, and this is a particularly Oof. dangerous swamp. I mean, with the uh, the quick muck, which is oh. a complete invention, you know. <laughs> there's not, I don't think there's any such thing, you know, as quick muck. But I, I thought people would, I thought people would enjoy quick muck. <laughs> Yes, it took me right back to the 70s when I was always sure we were going to die in quicksand. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I've been watching too much Gilligan's Island or something. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, the creatures, I mean, you'd have like seven different words for something, for any given thing. And just the language was so evocative and so visceral that it added to the tension. They oh. were never... They were never cigarettes. They were coffin nails, you know, and they were. <laughs> I know. I, that was fun to do that. A few people I met had never heard them called that. I was kind of surprised. I, I, I think hadn't either. Kind of... No, I hadn't either. Oh, you hadn't? Okay, because it's kind of an, and, you know, I thought it was an old-fashioned thing, but maybe it was a local thing. You know, maybe it was a regional thing, you know. Or both, yeah, maybe both. Yeah, yeah, but it was definitely, I enjoyed I enjoyed calling calling them that there were just a dozen times that I sort of had to run to my dictionary and say, what are we, what are we talking about? And what does this snake look like? And what <laughs> I know it was the snake was fun because I, I've always been interested in that Massasagua rattlesnake. I saw when I was a kid, my elementary school was very close to the Kalamazoo river and one showed up on the playground 
And it was a big deal. You know, oh. I can remember when Mr. Mike, our custodian, had to come out and get all the kids away from it. And I don't I don't know if they called the nature center or if they killed it. I don't know. They made us kids go in. But I, I can just remember thinking, you know, how exciting that was. In Michigan is the only place where the species is only threatened. It's it's actually endangered and extinct everywhere else. You know, oh, wow. it used to be it used to be all over the Midwest. But we know people love to kill a thing. People love to kill wolves, you know, that people love to kill a predator. And I still know people who, if they saw one of these rattlesnakes, they'd kill it, even though it's completely, you know, against the law. We'll be back with more from Bonnie Jo Campbell talking about the waters in just a moment. You're listening to Writers on Writing. A quick reminder to check out our Patreon page if you are enjoying these behind the scenes chats about how these books get made or you're getting any writing advice that you can apply to your own fiction. This is a great way to support the show and help us out. You get weekly writing tips, you get tricks, you get some insights from our writers, some additional questions we sometimes ask them. Those are available for our Patreons only, and you can get those benefits by joining us up there. Check us out at patreon.com slash writers on writing. You can also purchase a copy of Bonnie Joe's book and other past guests from the show on our affiliate page on bookshop.org. We started that page to support independent bookstores and to help the show out a little bit. All of our authors are up there and Barbara and I have some other books that we both highly recommend on craft or just life in general. We've put up on that bookshop page. You can find us there at bookshop.org slash shop slash writers on writing. Let's get back to it with Bonnie Jo Campbell talking about the waters. So this setting is based on a place, but you fictionalized it. I couldn't find some of these places in real life. <laughs> no, it's fictional. So it's fictional. It's, fictional. Okay. it's a fictional Southwest Michigan. And I based it on two things. One is I grew up where I'm sitting right now in my family house on a creek. It, it's a creek that runs through a swamp. So I kind of grew up on the, on the edge of that. So it was... It was, it's not quick muck, but if you go down there, you can sink up to your thighs in, in it. It's very exciting if you, you know, in certain spots. And uh, covered with blood suckers. Ooh, <laughs> Everything, you know, if you played out there, you're covered with leeches. And then my my grandparents actually had a little tiny island in a river, a little tiny private island. It was just a little curiosity of the landscape and it, it had a walking bridge you couldn't drive to it and so those two things were meshed together to create the to create massasagua island got it wondering if you could recall if there were any details like either bits of history or incidents that happened to any of these characters in their childhood something else that in the writing process sort of unlocked them for you and allowed you to understand mm -hmm. how they would react in certain circumstances or situations that then presented themselves. So you're thinking like character building. Character like building, kind of... but yes, what really made them come alive for you, if you can think of moments where they yeah. were like, oh, um, I, I understand this person now. Yeah, I mean, it's both, because I, I don't like to rely completely on the psychological model. Like, I sort of like the idea that people are born a certain way, you know, I, I like to have both, that people have certain characters, the same way we all know two people who have an identical experience and they are respond to it completely differently. So I like to have the psychological model that, you know, Hermine was abandoned as a child on the island, as was Primrose abandoned. So they have certain characteristics, certain kinds of toughness that came from being abandoned as children and to grow up on this island. So that was some of it. But I, I do like the idea that they have, you know, there are certain characteristics of them that are sort of inborn. You know, there's a writer, a Jungian writer, Robert Johnson, he wrote a book called The Soul's Code. And he says, basically, we're all sent down to earth as kind of acorns that contain 
some particular tree. And if we're lucky, we get to become who we should become. And that is how I like to see my characters, that I want to see them become more themselves. But there are plenty of things. Like I do think in this book and in my book, Mothers Tell Your Daughters, where sexual violations of various kinds for women at a young age are very character forming. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, usually for the, you know, for better or worse, we can say maybe for some it brings them away. It, it teaches them how to protect themselves. But for others, I think it does scar them. I think for for Rose Thorne, who has her own scars, I think what really brought her to life for me was her mad love for for Titus hmm. in the story, like realizing she didn't just love him. I mean, she loved him in an eternal way. Whatever he might do, she might not want to be with him, but recognizing how powerful that love was for her really did make her character for me. And it then it opened up for me the way she... Like she is capable of a gr that kind of love. Not everybody is capable of that kind of love that is ultimately forgiving. And what that opened up for me is that she actually has some of that love for everybody. Mm. Like some of what, what her character has is this ability to really love even the worst characters. Mm. <laughs> and that's yeah. kind of a wonderful thing. You know, if you know people like that in your life, I mean, it's a very hard to be that person. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> to be the all forgiving person. But here she is, the woman who everybody loves to look down on. But what she has is marvelous. She has the ability to be in a group of people who could be battling and somehow they won't battle because she's there loving them all. You know, yeah. and she to me, she's a marvelous character. It's funny. I have some readers, male, one male reader in particular who just doesn't like her. And I'm like, how can you not marvel at her? <laughs> yeah. You know, he says he says she's lazy. She doesn't work. And it's like she works as hard as anybody, you know, as hard as anybody. But it doesn't look like work. It looks like she's partying. And for Donkey, I think, you know, I went right into the book knowing that Donkey was going to love mathematics. And so that guided me at every point. But I had to come to understand why she loved mathematics. And when I kind of came to understand her as a, she was a girl born into a family of all women, grown up with all women, you know, surrounded by this fertility and this swampiness. She needed to seek out, first of all, she needed to seek out order. And mm -hmm. so mathematics provided that. But she also needed something masculine. And there is something masculine about the analytical aspects of mathematics. Not entirely. Mathematics is open to men and women. But there's something sort of sort of masculine about the right and wrong aspect of mathematics. And so that was when I figured out why she loved mathematics, that was really enlightening to me. Yes. And her deep voice and her, yeah, <laughs> her masculine voice. She has many, she really is forced, you know, if you're, you know, that, and this is what I learned as I'm writing the book is that we don't want to get rid of masculinity. We, none of us do. We need it in ourselves. We need it in the community. We just need to get rid of the awful part of it that I think it's safe to say that we are, we are surrounded by some of the bad aspects of masculinity right now. And we need the good aspects of it, masculinity. You know, that's what we all want. We all, we all want to be wrapped up in in beautiful, protective masculinity. And so I had to learn that in the book. It's not a matter of, you know, avoiding these men in the story. It's a matter of getting these men to be their best selves. And it's also a matter of even within the women, we need to have the best parts of our, you know, masculine aspects of ourselves. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You know, and Donkey is seeking that. Donkey loves men. She's desperate to hang out with men because she's trapped on this island with women. With women. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Please stay, she begs them. Yes. yes. <laughs> 
Well, I think last time we talked, you had talked about loving from loving writing from the point of view of men. And I, I could see that in this as well. And yeah, I guess I was kind of curious about what unlocked the men for you in this. And it could be Titus's undying love for Rose Thorne. I mean, he was whatever her love for him was was matched right back. But yeah, were there things about the men that you discovered that unlocked them for you? Yeah, well, just thinking about, you know, being in their characters and puzzling out different. There's one man who witnessed a terrible crime and he's haunted. And it's odd that sometimes that haunting makes him a better person. And sometimes that haunting just tears him up and he's his worst self as a result of it. And trying to figure out why, let's say there are badly behaved people in our community right now and really trying, I, I, I think it's safe to say there are badly behaved, well-intentioned people in our community. And I would say I'm related to some of them. <laughs> <laughs> and so a lot of what I do when I'm writing is seeking to understand and wanting, you know, going into it, wanting to understand. And so, you know, what you seek, you can find. <laughs> yes. Often. Yes. Yeah. I love how you wove in. So we've, we've talked about donkey's love of mathematics and you really wove that in, in overt and subtle ways. I mean, the prologue is chapter zero and the epilogue <laughs> is chapter infinity. And so we get, woven into the structure, which, as we've said, is not a traditional three-act structure, but we still get this architecture of theme that kind of runs under it to give it structure. That's another thing that the mathematics really gave you. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed the mathematics, and I and I came at, find, also managed to figure out the feminine aspect of mathematics, because I'm, I'm always trying to figure out why am I so interested in mathematics, and that's infinity, you know, yeah. that's yeah. the feminine part of mathematics. And that's where we end. <laughs> and that's yeah. where we end the story. And and yet I think a lot of the story is about redeeming men in a way. And so maybe we have to end the book with kind of a feminization in, to some degree of mathematics and men. <laughs> right. I don't know. I'm only thinking of that now. I may I may take that I may take that back later, but it's it's <laughs> worth a worth discussion. But I did enjoy the mathematics and every it was a fun project to see where I could fit mathematics in to the story without it feeling oppressive to people who are not comfortable with math. Like me. Yes. <laughs> I know. I saw math. I'm like, "Oh god." Yeah. And so, I mean, to some degree, there's, you know, the math that we all know, the counting, the counting and the measuring. But there's so many other aspects of mathematics that are really beautiful and strange. And and I hope I brought a few of them in in a fun way. Yeah. I also want to talk about the fairy tale aspect of the book. So it starts once upon a time and I love how novels teach us how to read them. And once you read Once Upon a Time, you understand there will be some sort of fairy tale aspect to the book. And, and there was, you know, there's kind of this witch on the remote island. and um, <laughs> With three you know, daughters. With three and daughters. Most, and the youngest yes. daughter is the most beautiful. And the yes, most yes, beautiful. yes. <laughs> and she will save them all. <laughs> and we have the seven dwarves men and the, yes. <laughs> was that their all along and how heavy handed do you decide you, I mean, you have to be playful with it and you have to make it somewhat obvious, but you don't want it to be too obvious. Yeah, that was not there in the beginning. And, and I, I was, I've been trying to puzzle this out. A lot of people are talking about how fairy tales work, uh, Amy Bender and Kelly Link. And a lot of people are thinking about this. And for me, the fairy tale aspect, uh, the only time I use it is if it rose out naturally out of the story, mm-hmm. I don't put it in intentionally. I really don't. I feel it wouldn't feel right if it happened, if it happened inorganically. There's one story I wrote in American Salvage, the first story in the book, and I wrote that whole story not even realizing until a friend read it and said, Oh, you rewrote Goldilocks. And it's like, <laughs> Oh my goodness, I rewrote Goldilocks. And and I think that the way to see this is that fairy tales look simple. That's what how they appear. 
but they're actually not. They're actually more like, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to get this. I've been working on this this image. They're more like when you when you're a, when a stream goes through a landscape and wears a riverbed, let's say it goes into a limestone landscape, and a stream will wear away, wear away the landscape to create a riverbed, even into stone. That's the way that fairy tales are simple, because they keep being true, the way that a river flowing in a certain pattern continues to be true. That's the way in which fairy tales are true and possibly simple because they keep they keep appearing they keep being there and so yeah i had no intention of putting them in there but as they naturally arose then i was happy because i said now my story is in conversation with old stories and yes. that's a really good place to be because old stories are still around because they mean something to people so anytime you can then hold on to that hold on to that meaning and let it you know you don't be too heavy-handed you don't want to you, you're not saying you get that but you can have your story touch that story and maybe have a conversation with that story and it gives the reader a little zing of recognizable pleasure right yes. to know oh, i know big that. things yeah i see that <laughs> I know I need to talk to these other women who are talking about fairy tales and see if that's how they're working on it um, to see or if they I mean it's also fun to do it I have a friend who Heidi Bell who just wrote a fun story taking a, a fox in and out of every fairy tale a fox has ever appeared in or a, a, I'm sorry maybe it's a bear but every place the bear or the fox has ever appeared and it was just so much fun and and you're right you had that moment of oh I see it that's the three bears. Oh, that's the other story. That's the woodman who's in the other story. So yeah. no, it gives it. Yeah. It gives that little tingle of smart pleasure, a moment of connection between reader and writer without bashing them over the head, which is. Yes. And I, I long, my goal in this life is to be playful. I'm not playful. So my, every bit of play, playfulness I have is hard wrought. <laughs> <laughs> so I work really hard to get to where it seems playful. Well, and the great thing, I mean, because your writing is so, dare I say, gritty and, you know, as you've described, noirish, and the Grimm's fairy tales were so gritty and noirish, those those old original 1800s, you know, oh, unsanitized so ones, they're so brutal. And it's a palatable way, I think, to take in hard truths about how life works without making us run for the hills. I mean, you know, it's it's a... Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it's kind and gentle, it's not, but it's, yeah, it's it's, it's kind of a, a way to slowly peel off innocence from people about how life really works. It's yeah, I know. I, I make it my one of my goals to peel off innocence, I know. And I, I'll, many of my, I just was told recently by a very good friend of mine, she can't read my books and she's not going to, she's not even going to try. And I was like, oh, she's like, they're too hard. And I, even Ron Charles in that review he just wrote was saying, don't be dissuaded by the rough stuff up front. It'll pay off. And I was like, thank you, Ron. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can see. I mean, if you have certain, you know, in this day and age of, of telling everybody there's a trigger warning, if you have certain triggers, I suppose, you know, this this might do it. But ugh, it's, it's too good to miss, though. You can't walk away. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So to talk about revision, I heard you say you had revised this in the hundreds of times. And then when the ARC finally came out, these advanced readers copies, you revised it another thousand times or had a thousand edits or something. So I'm wondering kind of what that process looks like, but also just like when they retch it out of your gripped hands. To <laughs> I know a deadline is a brutal thing for somebody yeah. like me. It really means something. And also I, I'm, I'm torn because I'm you know, I'm an upstanding Midwestern farm farm kid, so I I dutifully meet a deadline, but then I I nearly kill myself in order to meet the deadline. But uh, I revise 
I've been trying to come up with a metaphor for this as well. And, and I have a friend, Andy Mozina, and when he revises, he figures out in advance what he needs to revise, and then he goes in there and revises it and does it. And I'm so jealous of him because I think what I do is I say, oh, damn, it needs revision. And I never know exactly what it needs. I just know it needs to be better. So I think I, I think I put on my revision suit like I'm a like a swimsuit. I put it on and I leap back into the novel, and then I I'm over my head and I'm splashing around. I'm splashing around trying to trying to think. Okay, where's some solid ground I can stand on where I know that everything is perfect, everything is just right, and then so that I can reach the start moving toward the place that I know needs to be resigned because I just know it needs to be better. I know that I didn't like the way it felt before. And so I just find myself chaotic. I mean, I, I'm, I wish I could have a cool head about it, but I never do. I just know that it doesn't feel right. And I have to go in there and feel my way through it again. You know, it's, I can remember one scene with Rose Thorne where she makes an offhand comment in the, in that, I'm going to tell you after we're done, when, when Rose Thorne thinks about her daughter and how she feels about her daughter, there's a moment where like that went in, in the arc. And I just, I woke up in the middle of the night saying, that's not right. Mm -hmm. I just made that too simple and too cruel maybe, or too simple somehow. Mm -hmm. And I just like was in a nightmare scenario. Like, how do I say this complicated thing? And I just had to live inside that for days. I just had to keep going to that. It was only one paragraph, but I had to live in that paragraph for days. I tried out 10 different things, 20 different things. I just kept trying and trying, and finally I nailed it. And I was never so happy as when, because you know how a mother, how a mother feels about her daughter and how she expresses that is so important. You know, there's nothing more important than that. And so, yeah, I wish that I could be, I wish I could be a confident person who knew exactly what I was trying to do, and then I would just do it, and then I would congratulate myself and pat myself on the back and feel good. But instead, it's always just a mad scramble. And just getting the language just right. I, If I had not had Jamie Gordon as my main fiction teacher, I probably would have been a totally different writer. I probably would have been a writer of mainly from plot. But she taught me how to solve problems using language. She taught me that often that is how you solve problems, by getting the language just right. And so I bless her and curse her for making me the writer I am. Say more about that. So the cadence and sound of the words or the meaning, strange meaning of the words or the... Yeah, it has to be all, all of it. it. And it, ha and it has to be word choice. And I don't have any prescription for it, except that I have to live in a sentence or a paragraph. Often it's a paragraph, so it has to be a couple of sentences coming together. So I just have to live in it and swim in it. And I just have to read it over and over and over again and feel for anything that is untrue and dishonest and oversimplified. Often what I find is something that I I oversimplified it and that's a you know that's a kind of dishonesty and it needs that that means it needs a little bit more and you know often it'll be I think for me that's where you know all the writers say they have to kill their darlings and often it'll happen when I've come up with something clever you know, uh, something very quotable. And then the more I read over it, the more I realize it's slightly dishonest. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's slightly off. And it kind of makes sense that if you can pull out a sentence out of a novel and have it stand by itself, it, it might very well mean that that's something that's oversimplified. That's rough. 
<laughs> I know because you want to have these clever things that people can pull out of the book right, right. <laughs> and point to and say, look what a good writer Bonnie is. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. As you're saying it, I'm like, ooh, I'm going to have to get, I'm going to have to erase a lot of things now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nope, that's, that's such maybe a good, not. That's a maybe such... you won't have to erase them. Maybe you need to just go in and add a tiny bit more. There you go. And in terms of organization of material, because it's a big book and there's right. a lot of and moving I parts. did move I did have to move big chunks around a lot. And and that was some of what I'm do what I was doing. I did, like I said, I drew a lot of pictures and I did move chunks around and experiment with how they felt in different spots. And people have various realizations in the book. You know, I guess epif people have certain epiphanies or relationships have to sort of come to a head in a certain way. And because the book is not moving in just one person's life and point of view, it has to be how these events occur to mean the most to the whole community. That was the real challenge. So if Rose Thorne goes away, how does everything have to lead to that in the community as opposed to just in the main characters? So yeah, I was willing to try anything. I was very willing to try, and I was, like I said, I'm very willing to cut out a lot of things. Even fairly late in the game, I, I think I won't be, have a spoiler to, if I say there are community parties that occur. Mm -hmm. And I really had parties, like I said, a night at the bar with fun friends is a really great thing. A good party is a really fun thing. But I had to make, I had to make sure that each moment at the party was doing unique work. And if it wasn't, I had to cut it out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, figuring out where those community get togethers are, where you bring all the people of the community together, where do those have to occur to be the most meaningful? So a lot of it is drawing pictures. And I did, I think I did do character arcs for each of the main characters. And ideally, if you do that, you find a way that everybody's crisis can occur at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, the arc of this character and the, so I wanted to have the whole community have to have kind of a crisis at the same time, you know, and being willing, you know, thank goodness for cut and paste. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. How, did, how did Dickens do it? <laughs> <laughs> right. I do wonder that, you know, those people who still write on typewriters, I'm like, man, that would be tough now because, yeah, you've really got to. Yeah. So Joyce Carol Oates, she must have a magnificent brain because she says she is writing. I think she's still writing those first drafts. <gasps> no, is she writing her first drafts longhand? I she think writes. it's I think yeah. it's longhand. I think it's longhand, which is even harder. Yeah. Very strong fingers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> oh, this is so fun. Is there advice that you give to your students that we didn't mention that you think is particularly important that, that we should get in here? Oh, there's, you know, it's so just much, so right much. Now. And, yeah. but I want to, I just, my advice for all the writers is that I, I wish I could remove by showing how difficult it is and by showing how there's not one form. There's so many different forms. I'm glad you mentioned, I'm going to look up that writer that you mentioned, that I'd like to get rid of the mystique that there's any magical way to do this, that there's any particular way to do this, that we need everybody's stories and we need them to be told in unique ways. We really do. This is, you know, the, the writing project is for all of us. And try not to get discouraged. There were moments in writing this when I really thought I had nothing. I really did. I really thought I didn't have a book and that I had maybe just wasted a lot of time. But if, if you have the energy to keep on, keep working on a project, then keep asking the project what it wants to be. The truth is in the thing you are writing. The truth is in there. Don't trust outside sources to the degree that you're neglecting the inside, you know, the thing you're actually in the midst of, trust that. 
You know, go to sleep at night and ask your novel in progress. What do you want from me? <laughs> Yeah, and you've got a great, your old website, which I'll link to. I'll link to both of them. But Did, were you able to find has, my old website? Yes. Yeah. Good, because I, I, I really wanted to make sure we kept that, even though I was trying to get a new, simpler, cleaner website that a friend helped me with. And I really am glad that old one is, a lot of the stuff is out of date, but I thought it was good to have. So thank you for putting that up there. I'm going to put it up there because you've really got a lot of writing advice up there, especially for people working in the short story forum and how to get published and where to publish and simultaneous submissions, all that stuff is in there. Oh, so I, good. Good yeah, good. I definitely need to let people know about that. And we will follow you on your website. And you, you do a little social media. I see you here and there on Facebook. Yeah, I've got a, I'm actually doing a sub stack right now. So I'm oh, doing good. a sub stack for the waters. So any, anybody who wants any background information, I'm telling it all in there. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we'll link to that as well. So people can find you there and then we'll just beg you to do a book tour all over the place so we can all come and oh, fan, fan girl you. on you. <laughs> thank you. I am so, I am so glad to talk to you, Marie. That was Bonnie Jo Campbell. The book is The Waters. It is out next week, published by Norton. In addition to our Patreon page, you can always visit our websites. Barbara's is penonfire.com. Mine is mariestone.com. You can always follow us on the show's website, which is writersonwriting.com. We have an archive of all of our past shows up there, as well as information on Patreon, how to support the show, those types of things. You can always subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Stitcher, however you consume your podcasts. As always, our fantastic music and sound editing was provided by Travis Barrett. You can find him at travisbarrett.mykajabi.com. That's all the time we have for today. Tune in next week. Thanks so much for joining me. Happy New Year and have a great day.